and air pollution is something we can do something about. And it is a crime that we're sitting here today in 2021 saying 8.8 million people die from air pollution. This shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening. And may I just add, if you clean up the air, you are also solving the problem of climate change as well. You're listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring or scary. My name is Marian Pasha and I'm the director and curator at Telex London and co-host of this podcast, along with the amazing Ben Hurst. Say hello, Ben. Hey there, friends. I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like, humble model and climate normal. For today's episode, we wanted to give you a heads up that we're going to be talking about some pretty heavy topics, including bereavement, loss and ill health. So if you're not in a place to listen to this today, that's completely fine. Maybe pause it and come back to it later. Otherwise, strap yourself in and get ready for another great episode. Today, we're going to be talking about air pollution, which is a pretty big deal if you live in London or in any big city or honestly on this planet. We've talked about it in previous episodes about how air pollution is linked to greenhouse gases, which warm our planet and lead to runaway climate change. But air pollution is also a huge health issue. The WHO says it is the largest single environmental health crisis we face. Air pollution has been tied to one in nine deaths worldwide. That's huge. That's 4.2 million deaths every year as a result of what is called ambient or outdoor air pollution. In fact, 91% of the world's population live in places where the air quality exceeds the WHO safety limits. These these stats kind of blow my mind, Ben, actually, because they're wild. And yeah, anyway, let's keep going. Our uh, our guest this week is Rosamond Adu Kissy Debra. She is a WHO advocate for health and air. She is a Londoner and a former teacher. But before we talk to Rosamond, Ben, you're going to tell us a little bit about her daughter. Ella Roberta was born in South London and lived in Lewisham with her mum and her two younger siblings. Before her seventh birthday in 2010, she started developing a rare and complex form of asthma. Ella was admitted to hospital 28 times over a 28 month period with life threatening asthma attacks, including five spells in intensive care. Tragically, Ella died on the 15th of February 2013. At the first inquest into Ella's untimely death in September 2014, the coroner concluded that Ella died due to a severe asthma attack followed by a seizure, which was possibly caused by an allergic reaction to something in the air. As you can imagine, her mum desperately wanted to find the answers to what that was. It was at this point that someone reached out to Rosamond, suggesting that air pollution may have affected Ella's health. And after doing a lot of digging, Rosamond found out that Ella's final hospital admission had happened on the same day as one of the worst air pollution episodes in South London, where the family had lived near the South Circular Road. Throughout her illness, Ella had been treated in five separate hospitals, but no medical professionals had ever explained that air pollution could be making her asthma worse. As Rosamond learned more about air pollution, she started to campaign for a new inquest for Ella. And Rosamond, I want to welcome you first of all to the podcast. Thank you so, so much um, for joining us today. It's an absolute privilege um, for us to have you here on the on the show. And to start off, I wanted to ask why it was so important to have a new inquest for Ella. Hello, hello, listeners, and good afternoon um, from London. Um, I think for me, the reason why um, I had a second inquest, actually, we, we didn't decide straight away whether it was going to be an inquest or, or a public inquiry. But after the first inquest, one of the things that came out um, that said her, her triggers were something to do with something in the air. And that's what um, they concluded. And I had a child death review. And I remember the doctor at the time at the child death review was saying, 
something in the air could be anything really he said to me look if you find or if new information comes up we will reopen the child death review again and and you said that the that you found new evidence right and that's like that's so ambiguous like something in the air like you say could literally be anything um and there is no way of no way of knowing what that means whether whether that means like you need to move whether that means like there's like air poisoning or what whatever it might be so i'm interested to know like what what it was that you found in the new inquest what were what were those new pieces of evidence that you discovered well let's start off from the child death review i put something in my local newspaper just really appealing whether um anyone could help me um get to the bottom of why she might have died um, now some people might have said well she had asthma full stop i.e end of but as a teacher i thought do you really get a child who is incredibly healthy suddenly out of the blue become that severe but I was open to, by the way, not finding out. And I remember the question they asked me, had I looked at um, the levels of air pollution um, in my neighborhood the night before she passed away? And I've got to be honest, goodness me, I, I hope he's not listening <laughs> right. to this. I thought, oh, not another crankpot. Because right. people had come up with all sorts of theories from her diet to is she allergic to this, to that. So when I got this information, you know how you talk to your friends about it. And she saw, I don't know where she saw this advert or something. And my lawyer was asking for people who believed they had been affected by air pollution to come forward. And I can remember um, going up to Houston walking into this like amazing massive office yeah. my first thing was i, I ain't got any money to be yeah. hiring her lawyer from here that was my sort of thing and no 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 seriously and i can remember going in it, you know what? i'm just laughing because yeah. my 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 beginning pitch wasn't great that i, I was like um i think i've got something mm -hmm. i.e what you are mm -hmm. looking for i've got no money i'm not going to sell my house but I think I have what you need. And that's how we kind of started. I mean, my, be my beginning pitch was not great. And I think she kind of must have smiled um, at me. But I think what happened was she was a genius that put together, who came up with the idea of looking at when Ella went into hospital and what was going on pollution-wise on the day she was going to hospital. That was definitely... Um, her idea and it just so happened that on days this is why I'm always very careful when people say um, would you advise other people to take action etc etc et now we were lucky because most of her hospital admissions correlated on high air pollution days so that made the case stronger so when we had enough evidence, it was then we had to find an expert to back up what we were saying. Because what we were asking the attorney general to do, which is very, very rare, is quash the first inquest and ask for a new one. So you need quite a lot of evidence to do that. And attorney general is not just going to quash an inquest because he feels sorry for me or because my daughter has died, he would need to do it because he believes there is sufficient evidence to, to win or for or, or the evidence we are bringing is going to stand up in court again. This is what people don't understand. So rare for anyone to quash an inquest. So what people need to understand is we had to have overwhelming evidence to prove and also that the new evidence will stand up in court and someone wasn't just going to come and just rubbish it. And do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it all sounds really easy now, but it absolutely wasn't. Why did I do it? I did it because as her mother, 
I did want to know ultimately why she died. Why did she become so ill? Um, she did have siblings, and obviously they wanted to know. She had friends because it was basically she went home for a half term, and then she came back to school, and then she had this uncontrollable asthma. So within a week, she kind of left school before October half term. She was okay. She came back. And from that moment on till she died, it was hell on earth, basically. And there just had to be some explanation. But guess what, Ben? I did also accept that in life, sometimes, sometimes there are no answers. You have to accept that. So I wasn't going in thinking, yay, I'm going to win. Yeah. And that's huge, right? Like, just so, this do you idea see what of I mean? like, this this thing doesn't exist to provide me with answers or with the answers to the to the questions that I'm asking, um, and then to go through that process and and get to the end of it and not have the answers and then to do it again, um, also with the understanding that like maybe there will be no answers. Yeah, you have to be prepared. So part of me was mentally. I mean, I spent. When Ella died in 2013, I don't think I met my lawyer maybe to, to 2015 or 16. I can't remember. I spent the first two years recovering. I couldn't walk. My friend, you know, grief for me was a very physical, physical thing. And, yeah, I literally couldn't walk for quite a while. I, you know, my friend remembered, reminded me the other day. Remember when you used to walk with, with a walking stick? That's how debilitating Ella's, Ella's passing, it kind of really hit me physically. So it, it, it was as if you're being stabbed by her knife, but the knife was invisible. So that's how it kind of um, felt. And for a long time, I didn't know I was going to recover. Um, but I think the, the mind is an amazing thing. And it makes you, and that's why I'm very careful when I do interviews now, not to divulge too much in detail about her illness, what happened. Because sometimes you can open these things that you, you can't control. Um, and it's taken me a long, 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 long time. I mean, coming up to eight and a half, yeah, eight and a half years to get here now to talk to people it, it, yeah Ella didn't just die yesterday it's taking me so for a long time I wasn't in the public domain even when we were putting the case together so we actually made a conscious decision when we were ready to go and speak to the media and by then I was ready and we need to we needed to get the public involved because it was severely political as well i really want us to talk about the re the, that learning that you mm. you had and the and and the global perspective i just before we get to that i'm just wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about what the inquest did, did actually find and and what the and what the recommendations were from that yeah what the inquest found was um it was the illegal levels of air pollution that actually started her asthma so not only did it start it it obviously brought the premature ending to her life. So what that in effect means is without the illegal levels of air pollution, she would still be here now. So, and that then explained to me why when I went into court in September 2014, when the pathologist was describing the state of her lungs, why they were so bad, that she looked as if she'd been smoking, and I, I remember looking at her consultant, looking a bit puzzled, that i.e. when we used to put up her x-rays, we didn't see her lungs were that bad. So ultimately, we didn't really know the state of her body until she died and there was a post-mortem. So what the coroner then did is he looked at all the evidence and his task, one of his tasks is to come to a conclusion about why my daughter died. But he also had a responsibility to make sure this doesn't happen to future, anyone else in the future. This is part of the coroner's powers. So one of the things he, he um, so that he had three, he could have had many more recommendations, but I think you have to narrow it down. And what is best that's going to help everybody. So what he said is for 
the minimum requirement. So this is what, and this is really important. He said minimum should be WHO limits because throughout Ella's life, where we lived, there were illegal levels of air pollution everywhere. So we focus on the South Circular because that's where we live. And obviously, from when she got home to sc- from, from, from school to overnight, that would have been where majority of the time uh, was spent. But in general, it was everywhere. And also, she spent majority, apart from, obviously, you know, summer holidays when you go away. Apart from that, she was literally in different parts of Lewisham all the time. Now, the other thing he also... The second recommendation was about monitoring. And this is my big thing, monitoring and raising awareness. So throughout the um, inquest, the coroner realized that, for example, there might be apps there about air pollution and all different things, but nobody knows about them. So raising awareness is a key and the Mm -hmm. public need to be told about air pollution. Now, how do the public get told? You need to monitor it because this thing is invisible. So boroughs everywhere, countries everywhere should be monitoring air pollution and demonstrating to their citizens that, look, this is what you are breathing in and this is damaging your health. Now, the problem, how I see it, to just quickly talk about the second one is if you monitor it, you then have got the evidence in front of you, haven't you? So they're in a catch-22, mm-hmm. really. And sometimes I do wonder, is the lack of monitoring to do with right. uh, institutions don't want to take responsibility? Because the moment people know what they're breathing in, you show right. it to them. Rightfully Not so. everyone, but a lot of people are going to be outraged. And then yeah, the that's third... Right. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, and then the third and last recommendation he made, which is incredibly important, was that the medical profession needed to upskill itself because we were under five hospitals we'd gone in almost about 30 times and no one has raised air pollution well we now know when there's a spike in air pollution people have cardiac arrest and asthma attacks so it really wouldn't matter how well she was taking her medicine it was never going to work and that's what she used to say when I used to call the ambulance. She used to go, Mom, my, my medicine isn't working. And she was right. But those are the three recommendations. The WHO limits, the monitoring and raising awareness, and the education of the medical professions going forward. And this will form the basis of Ella's law in future. But I do think if these three three things are implemented all across the world, not just in the UK, we will get somewhere. But the fight now is to get these things implemented. It is easier said than done. Because even when you were saying before about the second inquest, I was thinking, how do you monitor pollution? Like, is there, how are there ways that people do that? And obviously there are because they've done it in this case, right? They've done it in this scenario. So what they're, they are even reading is different. And also it, it depends where these monitors are. So my message to people is, if you can going forward, mm. I would like people to have personal monitors on them, whether you've got it on your rucksack or wh- 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 wherever. We think this is going to be a game changer. What the damage is, is individual exposure to what they're breathing in. So what I took away from the inquest is, it is to do with our exposure to air pollution. That's what the key is. You know, when you're on that road, how close are you to that vehicle? And what are you breathing in? And that is why the actual younger you are, because if you're in a pram, you're going to be at the, the tailpipe level so um a kind of six foot five person isn't going to be breathing in the same amount of pollution that a baby in a in a premise and also people need to remember children breathe faster don't they (laughs) quicker you know children's lungs or our lungs they are not experiments Mm. to see how long we can take pollution for this is what people need to understand every single minute Mm. every day damage is right. being done 
and that's what happened to Ella. Do I think Ella just breathed in fumes one day? No, I think it was over a period of time. So my advice to people, it it is from my advice to pregnant women would be if you right. could avoid main roads and traffic, do it because they found particulate matters on the placenta. Yeah. And we're talking about each individual's journey to school or their journey to work or like literally, like you said, which roads they're walking down. Are you going on a main road? And I guess this all f like fits into a bigger picture of the necessary changes in in climate action like whether whether it's like electric cars or whatever it might be like we've got a it it absolutely does so if you look at data in the uk what you would generally find is mm. um asthma affects 1.1 million children but in the main right. those children will be living closer to busy roads that is not to say if you there are children who don't live near busy roads mm -hmm. there are children for instance who live in the countryside who have asthma that might be due mm -hmm. to the ammonia that maybe people use in farming so there are so or one of the things we have discovered is wood burning right. is a huge pollutant as well so you could be in quotes yeah. live in a leafy area and you could have a wood burner that's not going to be but for the general person who doesn't have all these things who lives near a busy road they are the people who are more likely going to have asthma and we know in society we all do let's not mm -hmm. pretend the closer you yeah. are to a busy road we know the properties are cheaper mm -hmm. so that is where the poorer communities are going to live this, this isn't controversial inequality in health has been around for forever it's just now when i mention it people just start throwing their toys out of the pram you know take a seat people and calm down you know this is long been established <laughs> i'm sorry oh god this is going to go out people seat. my kids are going to go mom you said you, that no, word take a seat don't so, apologize I, for it apologize to, think, your, to your listeners like, you know. right, because it for me it raises an, an a really important point you say that these things are not controversial and they're not like shocking and they're almost common sense um but people need to understand though people from poorer com communities people from ethnic minority backgrounds we care about our health just because we're not part of the massive, movement massive point. doesn't mean mm -hmm. we don't care but we have other pressures so may i stress this it's not that we we we, we don't care and also mm -hmm. people feel beaten down mm -hmm. by the system people feel they are not heard so people's attitude is sometimes mm -hmm. we're not going to make a fuss because it's not going to make a difference not that they don't care mm -hmm. they don't think it's going to make a a difference and that is, you, you, you know, when I started, there's still very few people who look like me in the movement. I am very grateful that I've managed to mm. get to where I, I have um, got now. But it literally took my daughter's case and her death for people to listen to me. So we're definitely not on an equal footing. Let, let's not get car carried away, um, you know, because what I have achieved is historic. It's a landmark. And it took me to get to that level to open, yeah. before some doors were yeah. open to me. See, see how I say some doors, not all doors, but some doors. So we need to, we, we, you know, pe mm. people shouldn't see me and think yeah. diversity. No, <laughs> that's not diversity. Yeah, one person yeah. is just, you know, isn't, isn't, doesn't show that diversity is possible. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I'm doing my bit, but, but we, we, you know, to, to, to bring it back down to the ground level, um, those affected are, th those that are most affected are from poorer communities, but they have other pressures. Look, they're not now going to be going out campaigning when some of them are isolating, even with COVID, because they, they, the same people who are most affected by air pollution are probably the same people who are most affected by COVID. Um, this whole sort of low traffic neighborhood and one of the um what one of the narratives which is really interesting is that traffic uh -huh. belongs on the main road who, who who has come up with that narrative that this is where traffic b belongs 
when we all know mm. these aren't the people who are creating the air pollution? Then everyone then jumps on it. Yeah, this is where traffic belongs. Did you ask those people that they want those traffic? No, they're, they're invisible. That's the point, right? No, is but it? did you ask them? No, you didn't. So now, us in the community or the movement, we know the dangers now, don't we? Let's not pretend. We now know the dangers of air pollution. And what's one of our solutions? Let's dump them on the poorer communities. And... I'm never going to think that's okay. We all want clean air. All our lives matter. Mm. But it, it seems some are more equal than others. A and this cannot be as as acceptable. And we shouldn't be shocked now that the gap in inequality in health is getting wider between the poor and the rich. Well, air pollution will be a huge contributory factor. I'm not, I'm not saying it's the be or an end or, but it is a contributory factor because we know it leads to all these illnesses. Can let me ask you a question? Because you mentioned it earlier and I, I'd love to, to find out more about this. You said, and I wonder if this is, because you've had this kind of verdict, right? Mm -hmm. And you've gone on this kind of incredible journey, both as an advocate and as like a scientist and, you know, as someone who is, who's trying to, I see you as someone who's trying to, create a world when this doesn't ever happen again and i want to know what what you know you mentioned this idea of ella's law and i wanted to know if you could tell us more about that and whether that's the next piece that you're working on so ella's law will be a combination and of what the coroner came to the who limits it will be about monitoring because i think that's where we go raising her awareness and I, I don't think it's going to include the medical professions because, can I be honest, they've actually started the process of educating themselves. And as I go along, I will decide what the, the third thing um, needs to be. But these are things to stand on. And it will be something for me to stand on worldwide because I believe all countries should be adopting Ella's law, i.e. WHO limits, and, and the new ones are coming soon. I believe all countries should be doing monitoring, and I believe all countries should be raising awareness of the impact of this on their citizens. My only point to people who say the air is cleaner than ever, why is it that 8.8 .8 million people are dying every year from contributing to it? Air pollution is the biggest environmental disaster r right now. And it, it is really, I keep on trying to make the invisible visible. That's what I keep on trying. Because it seems that unless people can see things, they don't believe it. Very much like religion. You believe in God, where's God? That's just a sidetrack. But it's very similar, um, you, you know, and different people have different, things in their country but we all have governments so it starts from that and then it filters down and we as citizens we also need to do our bit we can't solve it all by ourselves because you know it's got, when, when, when we come to burning of fossil fuel we all know you know it's governments who are pushing all these agendas and it, it's, it's about money but we also as individuals what I don't like is a lot of focus is on us as individuals and not government I believe there is only so much we, we, we can change. A lot of it needs to come from them. That's just how I feel about it. You can give up meat. You can give up your car. You're just one person. So it, it really needs to. And governments need to lead on this. Governments need to show us the way to go. People feel powerless. You, you can see an advert on, about cars every night on the radio, on the television. Where's the public health warning about air pollution? So it is not a level playing field at all, no. Like you said, governments have a duty to protect us and they, they have do. to live up to that. They, they um, do, absolutely. But I'm just starting it and there will be other people along the way. I think when you talk about air pollution, I think people need to focus on health rather than the environment all the time. And why do I say that? Because everyone cares about their health, the health of their family. So people need to see this as a health thing. And I hope Ella's legacy will be um, that she started us on this journey. And we hope at the end of it, the, the air will be cleaner. 
um, we, we hope one day um, th those 8.8 .8 million people will be zero. That, that's a dream. So can you say to get from 8.8 .8 million to zero will take a long time. And yeah, I, I didn't realize how political it, 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 it was, how much it involves money. Um, yeah, and sometimes I feel I'm a mum who lost a child who's just got caught up in the whole thing. But ultimately, what I want right. is I don't want clean air for some. I want clean air for all. Ella is a canary in the coal mine. What an amazing legacy to have left and to continue to leave. Um, so, so important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm incredibly proud of her. For someone so young, I mean, she knew she was going to go into the medical books because her asthma was so awful and they told her, but it would take me a long time to, yeah, accept that the daughter that I gave birth to, she is really eventually going to be responsible for saving many lives. And I think I'm more comfortable now that the air pollution movement have their poster girl. It took a while because she'll always be my firstborn and my daughter. But if by them adopting her and what she went through, if it will educate people, people can relate to her, then, yeah, I'm quite happy for her to do that, to do um, right. her bit. Well, she ticks all the, the boxes, doesn't she? Yeah. She's female, <laughs> diversity, everything. It's something that I have to... Yeah, it, 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 it's just an overwhelming feeling that there's especially a picture of her and people tell me when you show this picture now to mm. different people in different countries, they know who she is. So I think, um, Rosamund, I actually think this is a, a lovely place to wrap up our conversation with the legacy that Ella's going to leave for all of us and, and 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 the lives that she will be saving and i think it's really important all of these different things that you've pointed out that are that it's not just about it being like a symbol but you know what the impact it's had on you and your family and we just want to say thank you so much for coming to talk about this no thank you for having yeah thank you for having me and what people need to understand is they see the picture of mm. you know this am amazing beautiful child but when I said she went into ICU five times, I think we now more have a knowledge more about ICU. She, she, she did suffer incredibly and nobody deserves to suffer that much. And there are solutions to air pollution mm -hmm. and air pollution is something we can do something about. And it is a crime that we're sitting here today in 2021 saying 8.8 .8 million people die from air pollution. This shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening. And may I just add, if you clean up the air, mm. you are also solving the problem of climate change as well. That's what people need to understand. If you clean up the air, part of, that is part of the solution of climate change. You won't be able to get your solutions to climate yeah. change if the air is filthy and dirty. So that's what people need to. And thank you for um, allowing me to share Ella's story. Um, thank you to your listeners um, to l who, who are kindly going to listen in. And um, please continue to spread the word and hold your governments mm. to account. Thank you so much. We're not done yet though. We've got one last little, <laughs> we've got one last little section. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Um, so I'm interested to know um, if you have any climate confessions for us today, if there's anything that you want to get off your chest that you want to share with us. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Flying. My thing, yeah, my, my thing is definitely going to be flying. What I do um, mm -hmm. sometimes you do need to have a connection mm. and you do need to see people's eyes and people's faces. And there are many things that can be done on Zoom and things like that. So for me, it will be weighing up in future. I'd be absolutely lying if I said to you, I'm not going to be, mm -hmm. fly and I never did fly all over the place because I didn't have any money. But where I go to, I would want it to be so impactful. I would mm -hmm. want to think about it. If it's like a meeting I can do over Zoom, 
then I wouldn't even get on transport even and go and go and do that. <laughs> yeah, my life is full of conflicts. So every time I get on a plane to go somewhere, I probably still feel um, really, really um, guilty um, mm. about. And I, I generally like to travel, um, you know, from a teacher is exploring different countries and different things. But there, there you are. We need to just cut down on. But guess what? Because I am human and because I'm not perfect, I do my bit, but I am aware mm. and I do the best. I actually can. Mm -hmm. I don't set myself up to be super yeah. human or something um, like that. Rosamond, I'm going to tell you my confession for this week. <laughs> yeah. It's related to the flying thing that you were saying. Uh, and it's kind of a future confession, I guess. It's to say that as soon as they let me out of this country, I am getting on a plane. Mm. Like, I am desperate to go somewhere. I've spent my whole life traveling. I <laughs> right. have never felt so hemmed in as I have for the last year and a half. So my, f I'm, I'm confessing now for future bad behavior, which is that I want to. It's take really hard, isn't it? If you really enjoy visiting other it. countries, um, getting engrossed in their cultures, mm. learning about other other, other people, yeah. and mm. the UK is fabulous. We, there are many things to see here, but you do want to experience. Yeah, I want to see, of, taste and see and hear something different. But that is my my future confession. Ben, do you have one? I feel I feel like I'm going. Oh no, I did have seafood this week, and I didn't think about where it came from, which is literally what I was speaking about last week. Not doing so. Gotcha. That is something that I could do better of because I've had I've had squid multiple times this week, and I didn't consider. Multiple That's listeners, right. not even right. once. Multiple. <laughs> I'm close. From, from, I'm close. From, from the guy who's climate oh, no. perfect. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to do better. Multiple. Not, not even once. Mariam, we could have let him off if, if it was once. I know, we could have let him off if it was multiple. once. Multiple. Multiple. Well, then, you've got you've got a whole. You've got to, you've got to approve. We know that. Um, Rosamund, we're just going to say thank you to you again for coming and having this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate, subscribe and share this episode with a curious friend. It makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you. Oh, and slide into our DMs at TEDx London and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time. Oh, and don't leave yet. We wanted to tell you a bit more about who made this podcast possible. Yeah, we did. TEDx London's headline partner, City, has been supporting us for the past five years to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. And now they're taking it to the next level by making this podcast possible. Thanks, City. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hess. Stay curious.